Thank you for joining us for this evening's event. My name is Jeremy Garber, and I'm the events coordinator for PALS Books here in Portland, Oregon. Before we begin, I wanted to encourage you to check out our lineup of upcoming virtual events by visiting our website at pals.com. If you haven't already done so, please sign up for our weekly events email at pals.com. Please consider following us on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. Tonight, we are honored to welcome Tom Hartman and David Corton. Tom Hartman is a progressive, national, and internationally syndicated talk show host. Talkers Magazine named him America's most important progressive host and has named his show one of the top 10 talk radio shows in the country every year for over a decade. A four-time recipient of the Project Censored Award, Hartman is also a New York Times bestselling author of 26 books translated into multiple languages. In his new book, The Hidden History of Monopolies, Hartman takes us from the birth of America as a revolt against monopoly, remember the Boston Tea Party, to the largely successful efforts of both Presidents Theodore and Franklin Roosevelt and other like-minded leaders to restrain corporations' monopolistic urges, to the massive changes in the rules of business starting during the Reagan Revolution that have brought us to the cancer stage of capitalism. He shows the damage monopolies have done to so many industries, including agriculture, healthcare, the media, and more. Individuals have taken a hit as well. The average American family pays a $5,000 a year monopoly tax in the form of higher prices for everything from pharmaceuticals to airfare to household goods and food. But Hartman also describes common sense, historically rooted measures we can take, such as revitalizing antitrust regulation, taxing great wealth, and getting money out of politics to pry control of our country from the tentacles of the monopolists. Hartman is joined in conversation this evening by David Corton. Corton is co-founder of Yes Magazine, president of the Living Economies Forum, and a member of the Club of Rome. He writes a regular column for Yes and is the author of numerous books, including Change the Story, Change the Future, A Living Economy for a Living Earth, Agenda for a New Economy, From Phantom Wealth to Real Wealth, and the international bestseller, When Corporations Rule the World. He holds MBA and PhD degrees from the Stanford Business School, has served as a Harvard Business School professor, and has 30 years of experience as a development professional in Asia, Africa, and Latin America. This evening's event will also include an audience Q&A. Please use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen if you'd like to ask a question. As well, if someone has typed a question that you'd also like to know the answer to, please consider upvoting that particular question by clicking the thumbs up button. Most importantly, please consider supporting both Tom and Pals by purchasing a copy of The Hidden History of Monopolies from us tonight. A link to buy the book will be shared in the chat this evening. Tom, David, it's an honor to welcome you both tonight. Thanks for joining us. Thank you, well, thank you Jeremy. <laughs> um, uh, Tom is uh, the interviewer tonight. Uh, I'd like to start out with a kind of a personal question. The, help introduce you. We've been friends for a lot of years and I continue to be in absolute awe of your ability to do three hours a day on the air, always absolutely up to date on every detail of the breaking news. You're bringing out at least one new meticulously researched breakthrough book every year. You lecture around the country and the world and given all that, when Fran and I come to visit you in Portland, you and Luis are so relaxed and solicitous and hospitable. It's like you were both retired and had nothing else in the world to do. <laughs> now, aside from the wonderful, wonderful support you get from Louise, what's your secret? Well, first of all, David, thanks so much for doing this with me tonight. I, and and uh, Jeremy and, and uh, Bree and all the folks at Paul's Books, thanks so much for this. And, and to you who are watching at home, as they say in the television business, thank you. Um, uh, David, I, you know, uh, I'm just a hyperactive kid who grew up. I mean, I, it, I, I was... Uh, early enough in the cycle that I escaped the whole Ritalin thing, although all three of my younger brothers got uh, diagnosed and had that drug shoveled at them in, in uh, elementary school. Um, I was I was really lucky. I, I uh, you know, when I was six years old, Sputnik went up and Eisenhower started pouring money into the public schools. And our school in Lansing, Michigan, was one of a, a few that was selected for fast track programs. So by the time I had completed sixth grade, when I was 12, I had completed 
basically the entire high school curriculum. I, I could do, uh, you know, math, I could do simple trig. I had, I, I spoke two languages. I had had a year of Latin. Um, it was a learn as fast as you can kind of thing. And, uh, and then when I was 15, I got a summer scholarship to MSU. And then, you know, I, I uh, managed to get myself thrown out of high school by publishing a, an underground newspaper. And that allowed me to get to go straight into college. And then, you know, I dropped out of college. <laughs> but, but, um, but the bottom line, yeah, I mean, this is just, you know, uh, it's kind of the, a very different story from yours, you know, working all the way through your PhD, which I so honor. But, uh, and, um, and, and then going on the Harvard faculty, but I sometimes <laughs> refer to leaving the Harvard faculty as the most intellectually freeing experience of my life. Yeah, but I think that's, that's the bottom line is that I'm just easily bored. And, you know, uh, yeah. we, I get up at five in the morning and put the show together. We're on the air from nine to noon. And then I write every day from one till six. Wow. And, uh, you know, Monday through Friday and, and typically all day Sunday. Wow. So. Well, let's jump into the, uh, <laughs> your most recent contribution. Uh, that your overactive mind has produced and that uh, Ralph Nader in his forward calls, this is the most important dynamic book on the cancer of monopoly by giant corporations written in our generation. Uh, I was fascinated that he advises, don't just read it, promote it to your friends and urge your members of Congress to read it. And I'm in total agreement with the whole thing. Um, it is the most important book I've seen in a long time. And it deals with a defining issue of our time that is very well gonna determine whether we have a human future or not. Um, now, the, it explains with such clarity why in these United States, democracy remains a distant aspiration. It's perhaps getting further away. Most Americans live in daily desperation trying to pay rent and put food on the table while Earth is dying and billionaires get richer by the day, even with COVID-19, while planning their escape to Mars when Earth becomes uninhabitable. Um, now, uh, as Jeremy mentioned, you actually open this book with a real attention getter. We pay a monopoly tax in the United States of around $5,000 per person. Now, most people could make a really good use of an extra $5,000 a year. Could you explain what is this tax? Who gets it? And how, how does that all work? Well, it, it's not collected by the government. It's collected by the monopolistic corporations. But um, the situation in the United States right now is that there is not a single industrial sector uh, or, or for that matter, retail sector and, you know, business sector. There's not a single sector of the American economy that has not become essentially monopolized. I, I'm using the word monopoly in a rather sloppy fashion because mostly what we have are oligopolies technically, which is three to five companies dominating an, an individual market, mm -hmm. but they function as if they were a monopoly. If Delta Airlines raises their price $5, United does 30 seconds later because they're monitoring each other's activities. They, they act like a monopoly. Um, so the, you know, I, probably a great example is internet. Um, the countries of Europe all mandate m competition. Monopoly, they, in, in easy definition, a monopoly is something that prevents competition. That's, that's the main purpose of monopoly, is to, minute, to diminish competition. And uh, so in Europe, they, they, they require competition. So, uh, you know, if I want internet, sir, if I was a European, and I wanted internet service here in my home, even though Comcast owns the pipe coming into my house, you know, the, the coax, uh, they, are, they would be required in Europe to sell access to that pipe to any internet service provider that wants mm. to compete for my business. And so, you know, uh, in France, there's several hundred of them. In Germany, there's well over a hundred. In some countries, there's over a thousand. And, and uh, there's a vibrant marketplace there. So here in the United States, the average uh, person is spending between 60 and $80 a month for fairly crappy internet service, you know, 50 MIPS uh, down and maybe 10 MIPS up, or if they're lucky, 100 MIPS down and 20 or 30 up. Whereas in most of Europe, it's a gigabyte in both directions for 20, 25, 30, $35 a month. And in many cases, in addition to the internet service, you also get cell phone service and cable TV for that. 
or for a slight, you know, increase over that. Um, you know, so whether it's uh, airline prices, which are, you know, within Europe, much lower in Europe, or whether it's you know, flight prices, travel, um, what, I mean, pick your sector. It's, it's, it's all across the board. And when you add up how much we're paying for extra for pharmaceuticals, we pay twice what any other country in the world does um, because our government allows these monopolies. Um, we, uh, I mean, just pick one, you know, it's the, we're getting screwed 16 ways to Sunday. Now, there's a related issue you bring up in the book, which is um, how corporate CEOs have managed to organize to do what you call steal, steal wages from labor. Mm -hmm. It would seem to be a very closely related thing that relates again to this monopoly power. Yeah. Uh, explain that. What, what's this? Let me, let me do a, uh, a, you know, kind of a wide zoom. Let's you know, back yeah, the camera good. up here and, and shoot at a much larger uh, uh, canvas. Excellent. In, in, when I was nine or 10 years old, in 1960, I think it was, um, I don't remember which network it was, but one of, the, one of the TV networks rolled out a new TV show. It's called Route 66. And in this program, Marty Milner and uh, George Maharis uh, at that time, the, the Eisenhower Interstate Highway System was not completed, and the only way to get from New York to Los Angeles on a single road was to take Route 66, which for most of its path across the United States was a two-lane highway, and it mm -hmm. went through thousands or hundreds, anyway, of little towns. And um, every week, George and Marty, their names were Chip and Buzz or something like that on the show, um, would hit a different town and they'd have adventures in the local town, you know, whatever it may be. But you always knew where they were. You know, if they were in Biloxi, Mississippi, there's the Biloxi Diner and there's the Biloxi Hotel and there's the Biloxi Dry Cleaners and there's the, the you know. And these were all locally owned businesses uh, very frequently and, you know, Jacobson's department store, which was owned by the Jacobson family down the street, that kind of thing. And in many cases, businesses that went back generations and the economy was vibrant and diverse. And back in the 30s and 40s, when Franklin Roosevelt wanted to stimulate the economy, he put money into consumers' pockets. They took that money into the local community and bought things, and that money circulated in the local community. They'd buy something at the local diner. The local diner would buy bread from the local baker. The local baker would buy wheat from the local farmer, and the money would just go round and round and round. And my dad owned one of those stores. Okay, so you know exactly so what I grew up assuming that's what would be my life. I would be going back and running that store. Wow, amazing. Yeah. So, so um, you know, young people today don't, don't, you know, literally don't have the experience of this. And uh, what happened in 1982-83 when Ronald Reagan said, we're going to stop enforcing the antitrust laws. And of course, two years earlier when he said, we're going to destroy the unions, was that the two, the two kind of immune systems to the economy um, were, were destroyed, were, were, were taken out. Mm -hmm. um, I think the, 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 just to digress for a moment, the cancer metaphor is a pretty good one here. Um, our bodies every day are producing mutated cells that can become cancerous cells, but our immune system has, you know, a way of identifying them and destroying them. And I mean, every now and then one gets by and starts, sets up house and starts saying, I'm going to take all the resources of the whole body and they're going to funnel them into me and builds blood vessels and all kinds of stuff. We call that cancer and it eventually kills, you know, us. It, it, it sucks our bodies dry. Um, monopoly is the same sort of thing. So, so what Reagan did was he dismantled the immune system. And the result of that, for those watching who are old enough to remember the 80s, was uh, what was referred to as the M&A uh, mania, uh, mergers and acquisitions mania, people like M Michael Milken, who specialized in taking two or three companies, uh, two or three big retail furniture companies, and just smashing them all together so you could lay off you know, each company had its own separate HR department, its own separate advertising, its own separate salespeople, its own separate accounting. You could lay off all those people and, and radically increase efficiency and produce massive unemployment. Um, and the CEO of this new enterprise could get wildly more money. And, uh, and Reagan also dropped the top tax rate from 74% down to 25%, which provided a strong incentive for those CEOs to take that money. 
So really, I, I think in answer to your question, David, with these kind of interstitial pieces, that's what's happened. You know, we had a vibrant business economy in the United States that was kept that way by the immune system of the Sherman Antitrust Act that was passed mm -hmm. in 1890. And then the Clayton Antitrust Act in the 1930s and the, and the Antitrust Act of 1956, you know, all of its followers. And, and Reagan stopped that. And the Supreme Court also bought into this um, uh, as, as a result of some aggressive lobbying and writing by Robert Bork, actually, in the 70s. And uh, in a case called GTE Sylvania, and I, as I recall, it was in the late 70s. I don't remember the year. It's in the book. Um, the Supreme Court said, you know, monopolies are fine with us, too. And that's why we're here now, every one of us paying an additional $5,000 a year for everything we consume. Yeah, interesting. A question comes to mind as you lay this out. It's, um, you know, it's, it's so obvious as you say it, and yet it's not part of our kind of daily thinking and understanding. Right. Why not? I think it's, you know, these changes in the, in the, in the course of, of American history, they've happened rather quickly, but in the course of an individual lifetime, they've happened rather slowly. Um, you know, there were people, Ralph Nader was sounding the alarm when Reagan stopped enforcing the monopoly laws. Uh, he wrote a book about it. You know, he, yeah. he, he references it in the foreword to my book. And, uh, but, you know, people were like, oh yeah, he's being hysterical. And, you know, it's, <laughs> you know. and so I, you know, if you were to, you know, with Route 66, that old TV show, you know, every week I got to see a different piece of America, different culture, different customs, different businesses, different landscape. Um, now, if you were to jump out of an airplane from 60,000 feet and just land in any random city in America, you'd have no idea where you are because there's a, you know, Olive Garden and there's a, a, a Marriott and, you know, there's the, the Zane's Jewelry. And I mean, you know, everything is national chains now. Yeah. And I think people have just gotten used to it. It's kind of, it's really unfortunate. I, you know, I, I've talked to people who who visit, uh, you know, for the first time. They'll they'll go to. Well, were you with us with Louise and me in Dubrovnik for that event? Tom yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and and you know, we walked around Dubrovnik, and like, there's all these. You know, every business was small, locally owned. They're enforcing their antitrust laws, yeah. and. People come back from trips like that and and uh, and are like, wow, there's all this small business and all these family-owned businesses. I never had any idea. And it's like, yeah, that's how America used to be before Reagan. Now, you point out in the book quite, <laughs> quite effectively, this is not really a new issue. I mean, it's not like we first confronted this with Reagan. Um, you say that the United States was born of resistance against corporate monopoly. And of course, I was taught um, in school that the US was born of a rebellion against the taxation by the English king. But uh, you're saying, no, that wasn't the real issue. It was a uh, monopoly. And you know, as we go through the history of the US, it seems like we kind of go back and forth between uh, where this we're moving more and more toward monopoly or we're moving more toward local business and back and forth. And what, what are the lessons you take from that in terms of where we're at now? The book that's going to follow this book, which will be out next spring, uh, is called The Hidden History of Oligarchy. And in that book, I lay out how there has always been this dynamic tension between the movement toward oligarchy in the United States and the movement toward small d democracy or, or representative government. And we've gone through three major cycles of this since the founding of the Republic. And, and you know, that's really what's going on. That's why it goes back and forth. They, the, the oligarchs seize enough economic and political power that they can turn everything to, to, to them. And we saw this um, in the uh, period from 1830 to 1860 in the South. Uh, we saw this in the United States and across the country in, in the period from 1870 to 18. Uh, really till 1905, more or less, uh, when Teddy Roosevelt started breaking them up. Uh, then we saw another period of massive consolidation through the Roaring Twenties, and then Franklin Roosevelt came in and broke them up. And we were fairly stable until the 80s, and then Reagan, you know, threw us back into that kind of cycle, and we haven't come out of it yet. And, you know, we, there's a 40, we're at the, at the end of a 40-year failed experiment in Reaganism. But the, the original 
uh, battle that you're referring to, taxation without representation, was the Boston Tea Party. And I learned when I was a kid too, the Tea Party was because the colonists didn't like being taxed and that it all went back to the 1873 Tax Act, um, uh, you know, the British Tax Act, uh, which uh, was supposedly an increase in taxes in the United States. Well, it turns out it was a whole completely different thing. In, eight, in 17, if I said 1870, I meant 1770. In 1770, there was a uh, essentially a Great Depression, a worldwide massive recession, uh, and the major economy of the world was Britain's at that point in time. It hit them very badly, and the East India Company was a massive monopoly. It was started on, in De it was chartered in December of 1601 by Queen Elizabeth I, and was the first really modern corporation. It was the beginning of the mo modern American business corporation. Most of the stock was held by the royal, uh, by the royal family and by members of Parliament, and the House of Lords in particular. And so, you know, 170 years later, this economic crisis happens, and the East India Company is facing a genuine crisis. They, they you know, and so they went to Parliament, who still owned much of their stock, and said, "We need some help. We need some relief." The way that taxes on tea were collected at that point in time, which was one of the major commodities in the world, in the United States, we used two drugs, alcohol and caffeine, and every, you know, bars were social centers for for men basically, but every block, every city block in Boston pretty much had a tea house. This is this was, you know, way more than Starbucks. I mean, this was how people socialized. This was their lives. And probably half they were individual the, businesses too. That's, they were not that's right. <laughs> probably half the tea houses in the country were not buying their tea from the East India Company, even though they had a, a oh. you know a, a, a monopoly with the British government permission, the only permission to sell tea in the United States. Instead, they were buying it from smugglers. So the East India Company, the way that they paid tax on tea, was not when they sold it, which is you know how we do it these mm -hmm. days, but it was when they took it in inventory. So the East India Company was sitting on millions of pounds of tea in inventory in the United Kingdom that they had already paid taxes on when they brought it in from India. And so the British Parliament said, we're gonna rebate all those taxes to you. We're gonna give you all that money back. And so the East India Company suddenly had a giant pile of cash, plus they had a bunch of tax-free tea. And so they shipped this stuff to the United States and, and you know, with a much lower price than they had been selling it for before specifically with the intention of pulling a Walmart, you know, driving the local small businesses out of business by undercutting them on price. And the colonists were seriously pissed off about this and, and demanded that the, this tea not be allowed to, to, to be uh, offloaded in the ports of Philadelphia and, and Boston and New York. And, uh, you know, the East India Company brought along, you know, the, the British Navy and said, no, we're going to unload this tea. And that's, that's why the Tea Party happened. It was a revolt against Walmartization of North America. It was not a revolt yeah. against an increase in taxes. Well, in fact, from the corporation standpoint, it was a reduction in taxes. Exactly. Yeah, it was a giant tax cut that the East India Company <laughs> got that the American colonists were seriously upset about. Fascinating. Fascinating to look at these patterns, but also to see how what we are taught uh, varies quite significantly from reality. Yeah. And uh, this is one of the things I always find so extraordinary about your, your writing and thought that you have such a deep knowledge, not only of our current politics, but also of the politics going way back to the founding and even beyond. <laughs> it's a, you do have an extraordinary mind. Um, one of the things that I was fascinated about in your book was your observation that early Americans depended on the land, that, uh, that most people owned land and they had their farms and so forth. So in fact, they were growing much of their own food, which if you think about it, that's kind of interesting because they're not dependent on markets and nobody can make any profit off of their hunger if you're growing your own food. And as I read that, I thought back on my 21 years living and working in Africa, Latin America, and Asia, on a mission to end poverty. And one of the things that sort of came to my attention over time, I noticed that, you know, based on the neoliberal economic theory 
uh, the economists seem to be awfully eager to get people off of the land, anything that pushed people off of the land, so they would become dependent on selling their labor to someone else seemed to really get the, the, the economist juices running. And, you know, if you look at the United Nations and what, they, what I call their unsustainable uh, sustainable development goals, they have a target in there for eliminating absolute poverty. Mm -hmm. And that target is to get people an income of more than a dollar twenty-five a day. Now, I always thought it'd be really great to send one of these economists out any place in the world, give them a dollar twenty-five a, a day, and say you're going to live on that. Um, is this why, like you know, the Gates Foundation and all these folks are saying, "Oh, neoliberalism is wonderful." You know, over the last forty years, we've cut worldwide poverty in half. Is that because exactly all of those that. people went from a dollar exactly a day to a dollar twenty-six a day? Yeah, and what I realized was that's all based on you know, pushing people off of the land so they cannot grow their own food and they are absolutely dependent on that dollar twenty-five a day wage. Right. And this never comes up and gets discussed in, in these development theories. But wh what I'm interested in here is that obviously a, a similar process played out in the United States over time and I I'd never quite thought about this before. Uh, what's your knowledge of how that process played out? How did, how did people get pushed off the land and the control of the land increasingly consolidated um, so that in a sense, people are shifted from controlling their own means of livelihood to be dependent on selling their labor at slave wages to uh, a corporation. It's it's a it's a huge topic, David. Um, and I I don't know if you've read Ishmael by Dan Quinn. Um, yeah, a long time ago. <laughs> you know, his point was it all goes back to when somebody decided to start locking up the food. Um, money is basically you know a replacement for access to food, or it's the vehicle through mm -hmm. which we gain access to food because. Uh, and arguably access to water, but basically this and, and, and shelter, the stuff that we, we need to survive, you know, the bottom of Maslow's hierarchy of human need. And, um, but if you, it, it, more to your point, you know, how does, how has this played out in America? Um, there was the early phase of uh, the slaughter, the, the massive, the world's largest genocide of Native Americans. Um, probably the largest genocide in the history of the human race. Mm. And uh, which, uh, you know, part of which was carried out by disease and part of it by guns and things. And uh, that uh, made a lot of land available for European settlers to come. And, and uh, an awful lot of those folks initially were just doing subsistence farming and were living off their own food. And that, and that was not limited to that period in time. My, my wife's grandmother um, had a farm in Michigan and, and literally once a year she would buy 10 pounds of sugar, 10 pounds of salt and a new dress from Sears and that was it. You know, they, they, mm -hmm. they grew and ate everything um, and, uh, and were very healthy for it. But um, again, back in the 80s, uh, for those people old enough to remember, you know, Willie Nelson doing farm aid concert because farmers were suddenly going bankrupt. Uh, this was a repeat of something that had happened in the 1870s, 1880s, and 1890s that was largely uh, done in collusion with the railroads, the same way that John Rockefeller used the railroads during that same period of time to run his small competitors out of business. Mm -hmm. um, as people who were subsistence farmers started growing a little extra to sell into the local economy so that they could buy some cool stuff at the five and dime, uh, you know, that, that became more and more a consequential part of their output, and they were dependent upon the the, the ag economy. The, you know, the, the 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 wholesalers, the middlemen, the bankers who would loan them the money so that they could plant in advance, and um, and it, through that uh, thirty year period, roughly, and in, uh, in particular, in the late nineteenth century, um, you saw a lot of agriculture getting consolidated. Um, I mean, it had happened in the period. Actually, it first happened from 1820 to 1860. There's a, uh, several chapters in my book on oligarchy about this, about how the invention of the cotton gin um, 
meant that a cotton gin could clean as much cotton as 50 uh, humans, enslaved humans. And so uh, any farm that had a cotton gin had a huge economic advantage over all of their small competitors. And so over about a 20 year period from 1820 to 1840, um, the South basically hyper consolidated their agricultural output and, a, and, a, and an aristocracy and oligarchy emerged out of that, that w and, a, and a brutal police state that went along with it that uh, ultimately declared war on the United States and we fought the Civil War over, which was the, the thing that sort of broke that oligarchy. Well, it happened again in the 1870s through 1890s. And then, and then you know, it, it kind of, through the, the Roaring Twenties and the Great Crash and World War II, things kind of stabilized again. You know, my grandma's farm or my, my, mother, my wife's uh, grandma's farm. Um, and then in the 80s, Reagan came along and said, you know, we're, as part of not enforcing the antitrust laws, um, he was not going to stop the big agricultural companies, whether it was the seed companies on the input side or whether it was the wholesalers who were buying corn and wheat and soybeans on the output side from the farms. Um, he was not going to enforce the monopoly laws with regard to them either. And so these giant agricultural combines started forming uh, ConAgra and uh, Archel's Daniel Midland. And, and you know, basically, we by the end of the 80s or into the mid 90s, you had um, some huge percentage of America's agricultural output controlled by a small handful of companies. And because they controlled the agricultural output or they controlled the prices that they were willing to pay farmers, um, they could take a bad year and keep prices low, a bad year weather-wise, you know, where, where you've got uh, agricultural output has been dropped even by one or two percent was enough to kill lots and lots of farmers because they work on very, very small margins. And the result of that was all these farmers in distress who were selling their farms. I was living in Michigan at that time. And uh, or, yeah, well, in the, this was a process, actually. It wasn't just entirely in the 80s. Um, but you know, I knew families who, who sold their farms to these giant corporations and then rented the farmhouse back and farmed the land on behalf of the giant corporations, which is basically sharecropping. You know, we call the sharecropping in the in the in the latter part of the 19th century, but that's and that's now pretty much the norm in America. I mean, you know, it's the, and 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 you know, Willie Nelson was out there singing songs trying to save the farmers, but you know, uh, they they were nailed. And this Did I answer your question? question? Is that where you yeah. were going? <laughs> it's, it's a beautiful answer. I mean, not beautiful. It's a tragic answer, but uh, also interesting. It appears that none of this just happened by chance or. No, that's that dynamic between the, the urge toward oligarchy and monopoly on the one hand. Oligarchy is really political power. Monopoly yeah. is economic power. And, and the right and powers of the consumers and the people on the other hand. And, yeah. and I mean, they're so connected that I wasn't quite clear how you ever separated them into two different books. I mean, they're... <laughs> well, we pulled they're, it off. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Interrelated. Um, <clears throat> This this leads me to another question. Um, you know, the Republicans seem to be particularly aggressive and upfront about their agenda, which is pushing exactly this process of monopolization and the the interests of the of the oligarchs and monopoly. Um, and yet, so much of their loyal base. Are, are the people who are most harmed by these policies. How do the Republicans pull that off? How do they maintain the loyalty of this base that they're essentially screwing? This required a, um, you know, a real, a real shift in the Republican Party. You go back to the 1950s when Dwight Eisenhower was the Republican president, uh, you know, in, in 50, he wrote a book, a letter to his uh, brother, Edgar. Uh, Edgar was a hardcore right winger and he'd been harassing his brother, the president, about policy that had, to, you know, uh, American socialism. And Dwight wrote him back a letter saying, and I know you're familiar with this, David, saying, uh, you know, should any politician or political party ever come along and say that they're going to destroy unions and, and do away with social security and the other parts of the economy that his brother was complaining about as being socialist, you know, the social safety net. He said, we'll never hear from that party again. 
Um, he said, I realize that there's a small number of people, in, you know, multimillionaires in Texas, he was referring to the Hunt brothers, um, who believe that this is possible, but their number is small and they are stupid. Back then, the Republican Party um, and the conservative movement was not all about oligarchy. They, you know, they were more about aristocracy. They were more about slow and gradual change. You know, Russell Kirk and, and Edmund Burke's ideas of society having class and order and classes and orders and all that kind of thing. Um, but when when they decided to throw in entirely with the oligarchs, and I and I put that between um, 1971 and 1981. When they decided to do that, they had to completely change the way they did politics, the Republican Party. And the, the, the two events that set that up were, number one, in 1971, a lawyer for the tobacco uh, industry, Lewis Powell, uh, wrote a memo to his friend and neighbor uh, down the street, Eugene Sindor, who is the uh, chairman of the uh, US Chamber of Commerce. Mm -hmm. And in that memo, Lewis Powell said, you know, ever since Franklin Roosevelt kicked our asses, businesses' asses, we have been reluctant to engage in politics, which was true. Mm -hmm. And he said, but uh, you know, now we're under assault. And he specifically mentioned Rachel Carlson's 1965 book, as I recall, um, Silent Spring, which kicked off the environmental movement, and Ralph Nader's 1967, as I recall, book, uh, Unsafe at Any Speed, which kicked off the modern consumer, consumer movement. And he said, you know, basically these people are communists and they're coming for you and, and me and they're, and they're gonna destroy America and we're gonna end up like, you know, Stalinism here if we don't do something. So big business needs to get active. We need to create think tanks. We need to influence public opinion. We need to be building media empires. We need to put together an organization that can feed conservative judges into the, into the federal court system. Uh, we need to, to be uh, funneling enormous amounts of money into colleges and universities to endow economics and political science departments because right now they're te teaching liberal claptrap and FDR, you know, Keynesian economics, um, you know, and on and on and on. I mean, he basically looked at the whole spectrum of America and said, we need to take all this stuff over. And out of that, within three years came the Cato Institute and the Heritage Foundation and the Federalist Society and uh, this whole spectrum of right-wing think tanks that were heavily endowed by these, you know, uh, what we would today call billionaires. Back then they were merely multimillionaires. This is before Reagan cut their taxes. Uh -huh. and, um, and then in 72, Nixon put Lewis Powell on the Supreme Court. And mm -hmm. so in 76, there was this case, Buckley versus Vallejo, uh, where the Supreme Court ruled for the first time in the history of the United States that if a wealthy person owned a politician or even multiple politicians, so much so that pretty much everything that politician did inured benefit to that wealthy person, Prior to that, we called that bribery or capture or corruption. But going forward after 1976, we would call that free speech, that that money was simply speech. And, and rich people are entitled to have free speech rights. Two years later, in a decision that Lewis Powell himself actually wrote on the Supreme Court in 1988, First National Bank of Pilate, the Supreme Court ruled that that logic applied to corporations as well. And so what that did was it said to the Republican Party, in 1979, the billionaires and the big corporations are now available to you. And they can give you infinite amounts of money with no repercussions. Wow. And, uh, and, and the Democrats, I mean, they said it to the Democrats too, but the Democrats were like, we're with the unions, we're in good shape here. A third of America was unionized. There was a lot of money sloshing around in the unions, so much so that corrupt union leaders like Jimmy Hoffa could even steal a million bucks here and there. So the Republican party said, okay, we're all in with these people and that, produced the Reagan revolution. Now, all that money flowing in brought Ronald Reagan into office in 1980 and 81. And it's been off to the races ever since then, but they knew they couldn't just, you know, get elected by saying, hey, we're here for the oligarchs, we're here for the banksters, we're here for the billionaires. And so they had to find groups that were not entirely connected to the Democratic Party. In fact, groups that had some disconnection from the, from the Democratic Party that they could bring into the Republican Party, even though they were largely Democratic at the time. And that included Catholics, um, in particular around the issue of abortion. Uh, mm -hmm. That included uh, gun owners. And, you know, I mean, in, in, in the mid 70s, the yeah, So the picking NRA, up on these specific issues is how they got these groups. 
That's right. And, and they just sliced and diced the American electorate until they had enough of these crank followings um, that, you know, they had a coalition, essentially. It's, you know, in, in, in a parliamentary system, we would call the Republican Party a coalition government. And, mm -hmm. and the Democrats were still like, we're with labor and the consumers. We're with the working man and woman. And, uh, you know. <laughs> okay, we're gonna need to turn to Q&A very soon, but I got one other question I absolutely yeah. wanna get in here. And I, um, I, I assume that everybody else is marveling as I am. I, I mean, the, the Lewis Powell memo was, uh, I've been familiar with for a very long time, but you go into this with a depth, a nuance that uh, is beyond anything I've been familiar with. And I, I, I just want to bring that out. It's why your books are so valuable. Well, thank you. Most people who write about it don't actually read it. I sat down and read it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, <clears throat> I have to read it in your book. Now, I want to I want to bring in a question about the Democratic Party. That you know we've created this system in which the politicians depend on this money often to get elected. And it often seems that the Democratic Party, though they're sort of less upfront about their real agenda, uh, that they're also caught up in very much the same monopolistic billionaire's agenda. Um, what, how do you look at that and how do, we, how do we get back control of our politics and create one, at least one major political party that is truly aligned with the interests of ordinary people. The, you know, I, I, I write about that. I'm not sure if it's in the Monopoly book or the Oligarchy book, but there's a fascinating history of that. I'll, I'll tell it very quickly. Um, in, when Reagan came into office in 1980, a third of America was unionized and unions had a great reputation. People thought really well of them. Everybody realized that their standard of living depended on unionization. Union, uh, Reagan's uh, in, installed the first Secretary of Labor who was hostile to unions. Uh, he got a Supreme Court that was hostile to unions. And uh, by 1992, you know, just 12 years later, America had gone from, you know, a third being unionized to around 16 or 17 percent, as I recall, or maybe even 15 percent. He had really taken a bite out of the unions. He had done some serious damage to the unions. And as a result, the unions were the principal funding source for the Democratic Party. As a result, in 1992, there really wasn't enough union money to fund the kind of campaign. Campaigns had gotten very expensive because of the, 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 those two Supreme Court decisions, you know, Bilotti and, and uh, Buckley. And uh, there, there wasn't enough union money. And so mm -hmm. Al Fromm uh, reached out to uh, the governor of Arkansas, a guy named Bill Clinton. This was actually in 91. And he wrote, Al Fromm wrote a book about it, in fact, and uh, reached out to Bill Clinton and said, you know, let's start something here. Let's start something new. And they created this thing together called the Democratic Leadership Council. And the whole idea was the Republicans are viable, politically viable, because they're taking money from big corporations and rich people. Uh, we can't take money from the, I mean, we're just going to continue taking money from the unions, but there's just not enough money there. So we've got to go to corporations and rich people, but we're going to be selective. We will only pick those corporations to fund us that are clean industries. And Bill Clinton was candid about this. He talked about this on the campaign trail. You know, we, those blue collar jobs, they need to go away and we need to replace them with white collar jobs and pink collar jobs. You know, I mean, Clinton just came right out and said it. Um, you know, we don't need the unionized jobs anymore. People need to be the managerial class and, you know, and, and high tech and all this kind of stuff. And so the, the companies or the industries that, that Fromm and Clinton decided that they would aggressively pursue for money were banking, insurance, um, tech, uh, you know, and, and basically, you know, the, the quote, clean industries. Um, and they left, you know, steel and oil and, and uh, you know, the, the, the dirty industries to the Republicans. And who needs food? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and, and so, uh, you know, basically that was when the Democratic Party sold out. And it, I, I completely understand it. I mean, Clinton at that point in time felt that he had no choice. If the Democratic Party was to remain viable, uh, they had to do this. And, and, and I think that probably that analysis was accurate. But, you know, by 19, well, by 2000, 2005, certainly, the internet was a real enough thing that grassroots fundraising was possible. It wasn't until really the, you know, the, the, the 2012 election and the 2016 election, the Bernie Sanders did kind of proof of concept on that. 
mm -hmm. um, that the Democratic Party could say, oh, there's another way to fund our party. We don't need to be sucking up to these billionaires. And that's why the Progressive Caucus has grown so large. That's why the Progressive Movement has gained so much power and energy. It's why and how people like AOC and, 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 and whatnot, you know, the, the, your high profile progressives have been able to gain and hold political power because they're no longer dependent on, on unions or, uh, you know, fat cat individuals or giant corporations. In fact, they're proud that they're not. Elizabeth Warren, another, one, another example. So like we're only just getting started here, but I realize we're- uh, <clears throat> yeah, Just to, 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 to put a punctuation yeah. mark on this and to answer your question, I think that because of that, because that dynamic that Clinton used mm -hmm. has, is now an anachronism, it's now dead. It's no longer, that's no longer the circumstances. Times have changed. Now the Democratic Party can go back to being the party of the people and of labor. It's gonna require a lot of us who are progressives getting inside the Democratic Party and taking it over to really make that happen. Yeah. But I think it's possible. Fascinating where the story plays out that the focus becomes not on how we best meet people's needs, but how do we fund the party? Yeah. Yeah. Anyhow, uh, we need to turn this uh, turn this back to the audience, to, to Jeremy and uh, to uh, the Q&A. Great. The first question comes from Claire. Is there any way back to individualized small business? Yes. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, it's very simple. If we start breaking up the big companies. Uh, and in fact, we had a great opportunity to do that five months ago. If, if the federal government had not poured a trillion dollars into the coffers of United and Delta and American Airlines just to pick one sector. And those airlines that said, okay, that's it. We're out of business. We can't do this anymore. What would have happened? I mean, you know, people stop at that point in their, in their thought exercise on that. Oh, geez, you know, all these people will be out of work, pilots, flight attendants, you know, planes will be grounded. It's going to be a disaster. No, what happens is dozens of niches open up in the marketplace. And entrepreneurs can come in. I mean, this is how, this was what the air, airline marketplace was like back in the 70s and 80s. There were literally dozens of airlines. Just like in, in the 1930s, there, were, there, were, there was over 100 car companies in the United States in the 1920s, for example. So what it does is it opens up the market sectors. So if the big banks were allowed to fail, cool. Thousands of opportunities for small banks, for local entrepreneurs to start their companies. If the big you know, dry cleaning chains go out of business or the big jewelry chains or the big chain restaurants go out of business, cool, let them go. This is opportunity. So you know, it's, it's, it's not rocket science. It's, it's pretty straightforward stuff. It's just that this complete lack of imagination on the part of the political parties and the media when they talk about, oh, you don't, you don't want all these big, big companies going broke. I mean, that'd be a disaster, wouldn't it? No, it would be the best thing that could happen in this country. Michael has a comment that leads into a question. You agree, I believe, that the multiplicity of destructive issues we face in this nation and around the world are primarily caused by the monopolistic corporations seeking profit above all else, and by the politicians that depend on support from those corporations to be elected and reelected. Yes. As a potential path to real systemic change, do you support and promote the passage of the 28th We the People Amendment that is in Congress as House Joint Resolution 48 to amend the Constitution to eliminate corporate personhood and money as speech? Yeah, this has been my favorite hobby horse for a lot of years. Back in, I think, 2001 or 2002, I published a book called Unequal Protection, which was about the Santa Clara County case and, and, and the Boston Tea Party and, and you know, how you know, we, we just need to be moving in that direction. Um, the, the idea that corporations are, uh, should have human rights under the Constitution is insane and was actually not decided by the Supreme Court in 1886. In fact, the court decided the opposite. That's a whole other story. And, and the idea that money is speech is insane. And as I said earlier, mm -hmm. that was decided by the Supreme Court with a little help from Lewis Powell in 76 and 78, and then hyper ratified in 2010 with Citizens United. So yes, absolutely. I, I've been a huge advocate of it for years and years. I've, I've been a big supporter of movetoamend.org and other groups that have been working on this. Ernest says, I've come to the realization that the only bulwark that could have stopped our jobs and industries from going overseas would have been a massive union presence. What are your thoughts? You're largely right. 
and and those countries that have a heavy union presence, uh, you know, European countries with 60, 70, 80 percent unionization, um, the same in in, in Asia. Um, tend to have more protectionistic trade policies in order to keep manufacturing jobs within their countries. And it was the unions who were yelling and screaming in the, in the 80s and 90s as this free trade idea that Reagan and Bush had come up with in, in uh, 1982, 83, when they started really promoting this idea that, you know, we really should ship all these jobs overseas because they're, you know, these companies can make more profit if they can pay half the wage or a tenth of the wage. Um, you know, brought us to this point. But yes, we need to, we need to do that. Ronald asks, when Biden becomes president, can he simply direct the Department of Justice to begin enforcing the antitrust laws? Or is it a little more complicated than that? It's only slightly more complicated than that. There are several uh, departments, government agencies that enforce the antitrust laws. The DOJ is one, the Department of Commerce is another, arguably the Securities and Exchange Commission. But uh, the, the biggest problem, I, I, it's going to take congressional action. Um, you know, the, the, the DNA, the operating system, the, the uh, whatever for, for business, for the way that business and government interface is not so much defined by the president, it's defined by Congress. And so there's a bunch of changes that would have to be made. I talk about those in the book. Uh, Dave asks uh, to you, David. In your excellent book, A New Story for a New Economy, you state, quote, those who make money unassociated with the corresponding creation of anything of real value are engaged in a form of theft, end quote. Capitalism is based on the expropriation of unpaid surplus labor value. At its base, as a button says, capitalism is organized crime. We've tried repeatedly via Teddy Roosevelt's Square Deal, FDR's New Deal, LBJ's Great Society, et cetera, to regulate capitalism but corporations always find ways to circumvent proper regulations. So why try to regulate capitalism still again? Capitalism has entered a malignant stage. Isn't it about time to get rid of it and replace it with democratic socialism? It's all a question of how you define these different terms. Um, I grew up understanding that uh, capitalism was about private ownership and markets. But I always thought about it in the relationship to the way it was actually described by Adam Smith. And his ideal of a business was a single person uh, farmer or artisan or, or, or whatever. Um, if you look closely at his writing, he was against any combination of power that might involve two artisans coming together in, a <laughs> in an oligopoly, to use uh, Tom's terms. Um, and I also, I, th I think there, you know, there's a lot to be said for a market, but, you know, again, the, the market of people in the community bringing their uh, wares together and their products together in a farmer's market and they exchange them. That's a market economy. Now, our terms capitalism and, and, and socialism simply do not get into those kind of no nuances. So uh, I I think in a way we need to get beyond using either of those terms and we, we need uh, we need something we need to begin developing frameworks for which we we frankly have no terminology we're, we're handicapped by our language okay Linda asks how did small business fare slash exist alongside the robber barons in the late 19th century and early 20th century railroads chemicals etc did innovation mainly come from the monopolies, pharmaceutical research today, or the small businesses? Well, most of those monopolies started out as small businesses, but they were run by the, the ones that ended up basically owning the world uh, or their worlds were run by very, very ruthless capitalists. You know, John Rockefeller owned, uh, you know, something like 90% of the entire oil industry of Ohio and Pennsylvania. Andrew Carnegie owned more than 90% of the steel industry in the United States. Jay Gould and about three friends owned virtually the entire railroad industry. Um, uh, DuPont, the explosives industry, um, and, and on and on. And um, small businesses really, really struggled. I mean, John Rockefeller, for example, uh, you know, kerosene was their big business back in the 1880s. And uh, they would refine oil into kerosene, and then it was a big thing. People used it for heating and for lights. 
and uh, there were all these small kerosene makers. Anybody who had basically a still could make kerosene out of oil. And you know, Rockefeller would cut deals with the railroads where they would raise their prices for those small uh, businesses that were trying to compete with him, or they would simply refuse to carry their product. And uh, these were some of the practices that Senator Sherman found so offensive that, that led to the creation of the Sherman Antitrust Act. So you know, it's, it, that's that dynamic tension between you know, the, the rise of, of monopoly and the, and, and the assertion of the power of you know, small, vibrant local business. There's also the question there, I mean, there's so many complexities to this that there are some things that do require uh, larger enterprises. Yeah. But there are lots of different ways to organize them. They can be organized like the Mondragon cooperatives where they're, they're worker owned or they're community owned in a co cooperative kind of framework. So the, the, the primary goal is not to maximize financial profits, but it is to maximize community well-being. And so you organize and make your decisions accordingly. Um, but you know, these are these are levels of nuance and complication that we we barely get into conversation on. The next one comes from Karen. I was shocked when Time Warner Comcast merger was approved. I teach my students that Time Warner has a harness on what they read and see, and ultimately heavily influences how they think. How do you believe this control over public opinion can be neutralized? I think we have to break up these big companies. There's, there is basically, if you look at, at, at the, you know, the last 200 years of American history, I don't see any other way to do it. Okay, Crean asks, does modern monetary theory support the power of monopolies and the stock market? I don't know. I, I, you know I'm, I'm glancingly familiar with MMT. I, Stephanie Kelton's been a guest on my show dozens of times, and you know, I've read extensively on it, but I, I'm not a a scholar of it. I can't answer that question specifically. Yeah, I think you get into it occasionally, Tom. I mean, it's clear. Um, first of all, you need to recognize that money is nothing but a number, and it can be created instantly by a central bank. And we're seeing a lot of instances of that instant creation of money, some of it being used in useful ways, but ultimately creating money does not create anything, does not create the things that you want the things you need to use that money to buy. So there's a fundamental question of, as you're creating that money, is it flowing in ways that actually get the economy energized, or is it going out in ways that are going to increase inflation? And of course, part of the distortion in our current system is that it's fed into the financial markets so that it's inflating stock prices rather than food prices or, 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 or things of real value. And of course, flowing into the financial markets, it's further increasing financial inequality and the imbalances in society. So I, I don't know that modern monetary theory deals with any of those kinds of nuances. We've got time for a few more quick ones. Uh, Deborah asks, where do you see the hope for progressive activists moving forward? Oh, I, at, at the grassroots level. I mean, this is where it all needs to start. We need to be we need to be uh, electing progressive city council members and progressive mayors and, and you know progressive sheriffs and and you know and then all the way up the food chain. You know everybody pays attention to the president and, and the senate, but you know the, the farm team has to be built. This this is something that you know the corporatists really understood back in the seventies when they started. You know well this was Lewis Powell's prescription. You know build it from the ground up, and you know we need to be doing this. Robin says, the media is a big problem. There's so much groupthink now by the small number of companies that are more and more propaganda and very little actual information. Any thoughts about how to take back the media? It's a real challenge. Um, my wife and I were watching uh, Howard Dean when he was at the top of the Democratic pile uh, back in, what was it, 2008, I guess, in that election. And uh, he was on Chris Matthews' show. and. Chris said, uh, and he said something about, you know, breaking up monopolies. And Chris was like, well, what about media companies? Uh, and, you know, should, should big media companies be broken up, you know? Uh, and, and Howard Dean said, yeah, you know, GE owns NBC. You know, the, the NBC should be a separate company, it should be a media company. And so Chris Matthews was like, are you saying you advocate the breaking up of NBC? And Howard Dean was like, yeah. <laughs> and I turned to Louise and I said, he's screwed. 
And two days later was the Dean screen, you know, where the media basically took a normal event and turned it into, he's a psycho. Uh, so yeah, taking on the media is a big, big challenge. Okay, Ted asks, do you think the recent congressional hearing with Mark Zuckerberg, Jeff Bezos, and Tim Cook is a sign things are beginning to change? The recent what? Congressional hearing. Oh, uh, yeah. It, well, if, the fact that, that uh, Democratic members of Congress are even willing to come out and say to, to oligarchs who hold their fate and future in their hands in some ways, that, you know, we're thinking about messing with your business model. I mean, you know, if Zuckerberg wanted to take down a member of Congress, he could do it tomorrow morning. All he'd have to do is just tweak the algorithm a little bit, but all the bad news about that member of Congress, you know, goes out to 100 million Americans and all the good news just dies. Uh, and, the, you know, the guys who run Google could do the same thing. It, it's amazing the power these guys have. And the fact that there are some Democrats who are willing to stand up and take them on, I think is a great sign for the future. And the last question comes from Alicia, who asks, Tom, when will you offer your master class? I don't know what a master class is, unless you're talking about the brand. And I, I, I presume you as a teacher. Yeah, yeah. summation of all of your ideas. And I, I do it every day, three hours a day, five days a week. <laughs> <laughs> On, uh, Tune in. <laughs> yeah, Sirius XM and Free Speech TV and Zoom, and, not Zoom, uh, YouTube and, and Twitter and Facebook, and we're all over. Well, Tom, David, it was such a pleasure to host you both tonight. We're really grateful. Um, thanks everyone for tuning in. Again, please consider purchasing a copy of Tom's new book by visiting us at pals.com. Uh, David's books are there as well. And while you're there, please be sure to check out our lineup of upcoming virtual events. And we look forward to seeing you at another one again soon. Tom, David, thanks again. We're really grateful. Thank you. Thank you, Jerry. Thank you, Bree. And also at Pals, you can pre-order the next book, which is The Hidden History of Oligarchy which is the bookend of this book. That's about politics. This is about economics. And we look forward to welcoming you back for that one as well. Thank you, Jeremy. Right. Good night, all. Good night.